Hey guys, welcome to the Seer Generation Podcast. My name is Manny and I am your host. Today's conversation is with Felix, who is an entrepreneur that owns his own film company. Now we get into a lot of conversations uh, regarding Felix's upbringing in Lawrence, Massachusetts and how that affected him. We also get into a conversation regarding him having his first kid at 17 and the struggles that came with that and how he was able to overcome a lot of uh, struggles and stepping stones that would normally stop other people. This was definitely a fun conversation. We were able to dig into a lot of topics that are normally not talked about, especially for the Hispanic community. So I hope that you guys enjoy this podcast and you gain a lot of value from it. So let's get started. Three, two, one, <laughs> go. Hey, Felix, how you doing? What's up, man? How you, how you been? Long time. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm good. You know, just um, enjoying the, the nice finally fall weather that I much appreciate, unlike my wife, which she hates cold weather. Uh, I just thought we had a really warm fall to start with, and I was disappointed. So. This is nice weather to you? It was pouring rain and it was super cold. Like you, you enjoyed that? I like dressing like I like jackets. I like wearing stuff. I like layers. Mm -hmm. I can't stand the summer. It's not made for the summer, man. I'm so it's like a style thing. You just not just style. It's I love the fall. I love <laughs> the leaves. I love the changing of the weather. See, my wife wants to move somewhere warm. Um, Florida, eventually California. I don't know. Mm. I love the change. I told her she's gonna miss the fall, Christmas here. You know, it's just. How can you celebrate Christmas on palm trees? Ah, oh, that's my opinion. Right. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't go somewhere that was like hot, hot all year round. I don't know. I feel like Gosh, no. it'd be too much. We would get tired of it, I think, after a while. Exactly. So. Um, but for those of you that haven't heard from the great Felix, do you want to give us a few lines of what you're up to, what you're currently doing? Who's this Felix guy? I am West Philadelphia. But no, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> All right. It's not going to be this kind of interview. All right. So I'm from Lawrence. I was born in Lawrence General Hospital. Um, and uh, I don't know. I grew up here my whole life. Uh, I, not here. So now I live in Methuen, but um, it's Lawrence, right? Methuen. People mm. call Methuen Lawrence with trees. So, um, and I don't know what do I what, what kind of detail are you looking for? And well, just what what are you currently doing? Like, give us a little bit of detail. Like, you're running obviously a company. You do video stuff. Right, right, yeah. So, I um I run a video production company. Um, we were established. Uh, don't don't know the exact year, but I know we we say seven years now. So, um, and this is this is what we do. It's a family business. My wife and I we run it. And we hire our friends and close people to work with us on shoots. And um, it's just really fun. This is what we do. I mean, obviously, with the quarantine, with the virus, it's changed things up a bit. But, you know, we're still, we're still fighting. We're still living. And uh, God is good. So, yeah. We're still yeah, I mean, I'm going to want to get into how this situation has affected your business. But even before we get into that, so... Who was Felix growing up like as a child? Like what what does your life look like growing up in Lawrence? It wasn't well, not let me not say that. No, I was gonna say it wasn't as bad as people. No. Um it was cool. It was cool. Lawrence, um it was interesting. It it, it was very interesting because you grow growing up in Lawrence in the nineties. There were a lot of things going on. Lawrence still had a lot of white people at that time. Like I, when I went to school, I was going to school with half my class was white and half of us were Hispanic. So we had that going on. Um, I went to the charter school on Prospect Hill Community Day. Really good school, really good education. And um, so I had that experience. It was almost like a private school feel within Lawrence. Um, and then I would go back home to the hood like and experience <laughs> The hood, right? And nineties in Lawrence, you know, you had gangs, you had, you could, you know, you couldn't wear certain colors and all that. I don't know if you remember, but depending where you lived, where I lived, you definitely couldn't wear certain colors. And 
but it was fun. It was good. I was, I had a fun childhood, mostly because my parents worked their butt off to buy a house with a yard, which I loved them for so much because I had so many memories in that yard and I didn't have to go anywhere, you know, to find the fun, you know, a basketball court there. We had tons of space to play. And, and so that my house was a house in the hood where everyone kind of came to play. Right. My mom wouldn't let me go everywhere else. She'd be like, all right, no, you, you can just tell your friends to come here. So it was fun. It was so fun. So um, what did um your parents do for a living? My dad worked in like construction and my mom, she was in housekeeping and gotcha. they just, man, they took advantage of, you know, some good things that were happening in the economy in the mid nineties. Uh, I don't know with, um, what was the president of uh, Bill Clinton uh, he signed a few things. They were they were able to become citizens, and there were some good raids going on, and they took advantage of that, and, and just having good credit, and they were able to buy a house, which is a lot. You know, they're they're immigrants, right? They came from mm -hmm. Dominican Republic. My mom came from uh, through Mexico, actually. You know, and she, her story is crazy. It's like a movie of how she got here and all that. Like talking about like kidnappings and all that. But she, can you speak English? Yeah, she um she understands it and she can defend herself, but she's not uh, fluent. I would say. You know what? Maybe maybe I'll interview her in Spanish. <laughs> I've thought people have told me because when I tell them a little bit about my mom's story, they're like, "That sounds like a movie. I'm like you should you know, write a, <laughs> a, movie, a book or some kind of documentary." But um, yeah, so I have you know really hardworking parents, and they they bought us a home, granted in the hood, but it was our own home, and we had our yard, and so my days consisted of school coming home, basketball, and rollerblading. That that was everything, man. That was my childhood for so many years. Um, you know, remember, did you ever see the movie Brink? Yeah, we actually saw, uh, like, we have Disney Plus and stuff, and we saw, like, a clip of it not too long ago. But, yeah, I, I do remember. Yeah, you're, no. a little bit, you're a little bit younger than me, right? Uh, 30? 32. Okay, a little bit. But... So Brink was big in the 90s, I, um, and like rollerblading was big in the 90s, period, right? So yeah, when that yeah. movie came out, that thing blew my mind, like, what? You can go on ramps with these things? And <laughs> I had my mom, I'm like, mom, find me a skate park, come on. She found me a skate park in Methuen, and dude, I was all about it. I thought I was going to be a professional, aggressive rollerblader, and that was my thing. That and basketball, you know, that's it. And going to church, you know, my mom was, um, she still was a Catholic. And she would bring us to church, like all the all the uh, retreats and all the, you know, services and all that. She would bring us until we were old enough to kind of not want to go anymore. <laughs> so, you know, so we were, were your were your parents strict at all? Because I mean, it sounds like you they they wouldn't they would rather have you at home than elsewhere. And you know, you did mention that it might have been a little bit. Uh, well, not the safest where you live. So were they were they strict with letting you kind of go out and stuff like that or no? So they were when we were really young, you know, after a certain age. There were so many of us, you know, there were, uh, there's, uh, there were four of us. Um, mm. And my dad worked a lot. And then he'd get home and drink beer and watch baseball and play dominoes for the rest of the night. So he was kind of non-existent. He was just kind of you know, one of those dads that they're there, they provide, but they're not really there, you know? Mm. So then it was really all on my mom to raise us, right? And um, that was hard for her. Like, it was just too much. So I feel like a lot was kind of let go and kind of just, you know, just do you, do you, just don't be crazy, kind of, I trust you. And we're actually, we were known for having the least amount of rules out of all of our friends, you know? Um, because of that reason, uh, because my mom, she just, she was, she was going through a lot, you know, um, with my dad and, and other situations, um, dealing with, you know, uh, even like depression and things like that. Mm -hmm. and here we are, four kids, crazy kids, you know, good kids, right? But she kind of relied on just like kind of a trust system, like guys, you have this yard, you have my trust, like just don't act up. And she knew we weren't into bad things either, right? Right. Like she she live on she live I, I would say live in church, right? And so we had a lot of time at home when we were not no one was watching us, right? So um it was it was weird, right? So she was she gave us good advice. She was, you know, Catholic, so she would talk to us about God. And then 
But then other than that, it wasn't much of that strict stuff. It was just like, I trust that you're going to do the right thing. And my dad was just kind of around anywhere. Anytime we needed, hey, I need a dollar to go to Bodega. Like, you know, <laughs> I, need five, I need $20 to go to the mall, hang out with my friends. Like, that's kind of what he was at the time. Yeah. Um, and I love my dad, by the way. I have an amazing relationship with my dad, and he's amazing. But, you know, he was really young and just didn't, <laughs> didn't know what he was doing, so. Here's a, here's a question for you. Um, so my dad, um, he, uh, he has a third grade education, right? So he's, he's worked um, basically minimum wage job, actually the same job for like 17 plus years now at a Andover Country Club. Yeah. So he, he basically worked in the kitchen there, you know, us our entire time growing up. So we really, I mean, he would leave the house at around two or three and we were still in school and he wouldn't come back until like one or two in the morning. And that was, let's say Tuesday through Sunday, basically, right? Um, so my dad wasn't around either as much, but um, for me, I didn't quite, as a child or as a kid, I didn't really connect like, oh man, like my dad's not around as much. I mean, I think like later on, like going to college and stuff, you start thinking a little bit more like, oh man, I wish my dad would have been able to go to a game with me and stuff like that so did you have a similar experience or in you growing up did you ever sit down and like man I wish like I could hang out with my dad more no was it the same oh man we loved it we thought it was we we thought we had the best situation going on with our parents like my mom was busy at church and work my dad was busy with work and drinking beers and playing dominoes like we were kind of like in our own jungle in that house, right? We had my mm. older sister who she was kind of like the boss and she'd give us the chores and things like that. But other than that, we kind of raised ourselves to a certain degree. Uh, you know, I wouldn't want to offend my mom. You know, my mom was, she made sure a meal was there every day. You know, she, pro she paid all the bills and worked and all that. But as far as like what was going on th throughout most of the day, yeah. either she was at work or she was at church, you know, yeah. and and she did it, you know, she got so into church because of the issues she was having with my dad. So that was like her, like way of like, not, let me not get graphic here, but not, not, um, not losing it. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was by going to church, getting so involved in everything in church and um, that she kind of like, and, that, and, and we understand that, you know, and we didn't, we never held a grudge against her at all. Like, you know, what? What she went through was tough, right? Without getting into any details, like what she went through was very tough for so many years. So we understand. And honestly, the reason even we're people of faith, my brothers and sisters, um, is because of her, because of what she started, the seeds that she planted. So I, you know, uh, I'm sorry. I, what, did I answer your question? I don't know what you were asking. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. That's, that's fine. Um... It didn't bother me. No, I, I never thought about it until now when I'm older. And I see certain flaws that I have, right? As a, mm. just as a man, right? And it's just like certain things like, dang, I didn't get this. Like no one taught, not taught me this, but no one made sure I was doing things like, okay, let me give you an example. This is going to sound bad, but <laughs> my report cards, like no one really checked them, right? Like my, my parents, they were so busy with work and all that. They didn't even know when was what, you know? So I kind of, I... I was never too concerned about like, oh, whether I was getting a bad grade or not. But, you know, thank God I was a decent student. Um, and, um, man, this is, I don't know, there's so much you can get into with your childhood, right? But no, we didn't hold any, we didn't hold any grudges. We didn't even realize what was going on. At least as far as me, I loved my childhood. It didn't, you know, it didn't, um, it, I was never hurting. Like, oh, I miss, I need my dad. Like, oh, my dad was right, right over there just, you know, it's just, I thought that was normal, right? I just right. thought that was normal. I never went to a friend's, I didn't have any friends who had their dads, you know? So I couldn't even, I didn't even have anyone to compare my dad to. Mm. So my dad, to me, was the best dad, right? He he provided as much as he could and he gave us money when we needed it. And that's it. And he didn't give us a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> right, so like, to me, it was good. I feel like that that generation, and I think my parents might be a lot older than, than your parents because uh, they had us late at, late in life. Like my dad is like 72 now, so he's pretty old. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like that generation raised children 
very differently and it wasn't like you had those like seventh heaven conversations like you know what i mean like if if you were struggling with so, with something you're either talking to your friends about it or you're figuring it out right. and i don't i i don't i don't fault i don't think i would fault my parents for that i just think that they did the best they could with what they knew right but man i think that to a point it, it builds a certain character like you got to figure out your stuff like i think that what our parents and and i'm sure that you would agree what what they did when it came to like uh showing us the work ethic like you mentioned like them working their butt off and like um getting a house so you guys could play like those are the things that i drew from and like those are the things that i learned obviously there are you know us growing now when you know you have three children i have one there's obviously there's obviously things that we're going to be doing differently Right. But I think like, man, like that Hispanic work ethic, like just teaches oh, yeah. you so much, you Absolutely. know, it's crazy. I, I've been working since I was like, I got to say like 10 or 12 years old. Did you ever see those kids outside of Dunkin' Donuts, the drive throughs with newspapers? They would stand out there in the cold and just, I don't know if you ever saw that. Oh, but that was, no, no, I don't think I did. No. That used to be a thing, right? They would, we would, instead of delivering to people's houses, we, a bunch of kids, we worked for, for this one guy. Um, and he would put us all in, in Dunkin' Donut drive throughs like right at the end when the cars would drive by and we'd sell newspapers. We'd have them there and we'd sell them and we'd freeze our butt off and people would buy us hot chocolates. And I was doing that at an early age, man, because I wanted to, you know, that's what my parents showed me and that was in me. I wanted to work. I wanted to buy my own uh, toys and, you know, rollerblades and bikes and things like that. Even though my parents, you know, they, again, they provided, they, I didn't feel like we were poor. Like we were poor now that I look back, <laughs> but they didn't, make, they didn't make me feel like we were poor, right? You know, cause it's like, I can't complain. We have a house, we have a yard. Yeah, we might not be driving around Mercedes and have a pool, but man, I had a lot more than some other friends of mm. mine, right? So yeah, that work ethic was huge. And that put me to, I was working so early and I didn't stop working, honestly, <laughs> until, and I'm still working, <laughs> I haven't stopped. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I did the typical market basket job thing at, at 14 yep. or 15. I uh, worked at Canopy Lake, worked at the mall, um, and lasted a good amount of time in each in each place, too. For, for my age, like, I was pretty consistent. And then I got um, Claudia pregnant in high school, <laughs> in my senior year of high school. So that was, like, a whole nother... A whole Claudia nother, is your wife now, for those... Claudia that is my wife, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm talking to you because, yeah, I know you know her. <laughs> I got her pregnant in high school, man, and that just turned my work mode into kind of like super sane, kind of like, all right, this is no joke. Like, Walk me to- through that a little bit, because I think that, I know, I would consider you a success story. Like, you had your kid young, and now, I mean, I'm sure it was tough at the time, but you got your stuff together, you still have your family together, like, you've, you've been able, you guys have both been able to come together and provide and create a home where your kids are growing. Like, walk me through some of that. Like, yeah. okay, like she tells you, hey, listen, this is what's up. Like, what is, what are you going through? Like, what, what's going through your mind at that time? How old were you, by the way? I was 17 and I was in history class. And I looked to the side, to the door of the classroom at the old Lawrence High and I see Claudia crying and I'm like, oh crap. Who died? Like, that was my first initial thought, like, who died? I stood up, I ran out there and um, got to the hallway and she couldn't even tell me. She just fell to her feet. Like, what's going on? Like, what, what, who died? I kept asking her, who died? And her friend had to tell me, like, you know, uh, she's pregnant. And my whole life just flashed before my eyes. Who would have thought Felix at 17, would be having a child. Oh my God, I thought my life was over. Um, yeah, it was it was scary. But, um, no, nah, it's no buzz, man. It was scary. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> you know, we were in high school. Like, you know, I was I was working part time at a restaurant, and the day after that, that maybe that same day, I called them and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna start working full time. So, mm. many hours. You, you know, you said that was that same day you called. Same day I called. It was, it was I was working at so, Fresh. Hold City. up, hold up, hold up. So you find you find out that your girlfriend at the time is gonna yeah. have a kid. You're 17, and you obviously go through your emotional stuff in your head. But that same day, you're like, some you know, I need more hours. Yeah. So there was no doubt in your mind that you were gonna take care of this kid. Oh Lord, not even a thought. Not even like. 
abortion, that didn't cross my mind. Uh, le- just break, leaving her, that didn't cross my mind. Like, it, wow. I never thought about it, man, but it really just clicked instantly. Like, mm. oh, time to grow up, you know? Why do you think that is? Because that's not always the case. Right, right. You know, I think more often than not, it's the opposite of mm-hmm. what you did. So, like, why are you different? You know, like, what, what, what do you think that was instilled in you that you were right. like, okay, I need to own up versus, hey, listen, like, you need to take care of this, like, I'm too young, et cetera. It must have been, okay, I know what it was. So my dad and my mother, have, I've been mentioning they've had, they had a lot of issues growing up. They were, for many years, they were living under the same roof, but they weren't together, right? Yeah. Um, I remember I was in the seventh grade. I was still best friends with my uh, with that with my best friend from then. His name is, is Julfi, the photographer here in Lawrence. And he still we still talk about the day where in the bathroom stall in the seventh grade I started crying and he's like, "What's wrong with you?" And I'm like, "My parents they're they're getting they're they're, they're divorcing they're splitting up or something like that." And he started laughing at me <laughs> in the bath. Yeah, he was laughing at me. Yeah, he was just like, what are you talking about, Felix? Your parents have been broken up for years. <laughs> oh, no. But I guess at the time, like, it was like they were talking about, like, moving, you know? So to mm-hmm. me, as long as my parents were under the same roof, I was good. They're together. We, we're a happy family, right? And I, I kind of hid it. Like, I was hiding the realness about them not being together. Because as long as they're under the same roof, I still got my mom and my dad, right? Right. And... <clears throat> Yeah, so I remember that was a conversation in the in the seventh grade bathroom stall, and uh, they never got back together. They just stayed together. They lived in the, under the same house until we were old enough to, for them not to kind of feel bad about splitting up, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's actually, um, I think, it's an old school way of doing things, and you still see that a lot. But to be honest, uh, have you ever heard of Jordan Peterson? He's like this like psychology guy. He became really um, he's for the past no, couple no, of years. Jordan Peele. Been, oh, okay. Oh, well, he he um there was there there's been a few times where he's spoken about families, right? And he obviously says that kids that are born and stay in a household with two parents, they're gonna develop better than either just one or in a family that is divorce. And not only that, but he also said like, listen, it's better for the parents to be separated, but still live and be in the same house until the kids are at a point until they've developed to a point where they can split and it won't damage their development. And I found that so fascinating. And it's in our culture, specifically in Hispanics, like you don't like divorce like that. I mean, maybe you do a lot more now, but then it's like, you, that's very common. You see like, Two people that are together, they live in the same house, but they're not really together, right. you know? And I think that's where I got my character from because I was so hurt from that, from the thought of my family splitting up, mm. that I think that created something in me that said, I'm never going to allow this to happen to me. You know, when I get older, I'm going to be a good father. I'm going to... St- we're going to stay together and we're not going to do what they did to me pretty much. Mm. Um, yeah. So family was such a big deal for me. Like <laughs> I would catch and I'm, geez, I mean, whatever, that's not going to watch this. I would catch, like, we would catch my dad, like talking on the phone to some people, you know, some other woman in, from the ER. Right. And you know, at the time you pick up, you had several phones, you can pick up the call yeah. and you can hear what was going on. Right. And we caught my dad one time and my sister, she was the older one. She was flipping out. She's like, oh my gosh, we're going to tell mom I'm get, when she gets home from work. And I just remember like, no, don't tell her anything. No, what do you want him to break up? Stop. Like mm-hmm. I was willing to hide his mistakes in order to keep our family together. Right. My sister was like, nah, she's, she was older. So she was like, I'm, I'm, I'm telling mom. Right. But for me, it was like, we, we, we can't do this. We're going to break up the family. Right. So just to show you how much that really affected me and how much even trauma 
you know, that created within me. But that's also the reason why when you go, when we go back to the question, why didn't I just up and leave? Why didn't I just run away or do what a lot of other teenagers would have done in that situation? It's because of that, man. It's because I was scarred, bro. I was scarred from what happened in my childhood. And I knew how much family meant to me. And um, again, I had both parents there. Yeah, they weren't together, but I do got to admit, it helped that they were there. Like, you know, I had mom and dad, like my dad wasn't willing to, you know, my mom asked him to leave and he wouldn't leave, you know, because he was trying to keep the family together. He wasn't right, obviously, because he's the one who was doing (laughs) the crazy things. But just the fact that I knew how important family was, even to them, you know, that they were willing to live in a situation they were living in. My mom more like, cause she had to, my dad was really the one who didn't give her a choice. Like, nah, I'm not leaving. This is how we're going to live. Even if we have to, you know, I'm sleeping downstairs, you're sleeping upstairs, whatever. And that's what they did. So that's why I think I didn't leave because I didn't want my baby, my child to go through what I went through. Right. That's, that's what it it's that, it's that situation where you hear about it all the time. Uh, uh, a kid grows up with a, 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 a drunken father, uh, you know, um, or an, a father who's addicted to something, uh, drugs. That child, they say, is either going to grow up to be just like their dad or be the opposite. They're going to reject it completely, right? right? So I think I rejected it completely, that kind of um, situation that I grew up in. I was like, I don't want that, right? Because I could have easily gone the other way and been like, yo, I saw my dad do it. Like, this is what I, I'm out, you know? Like, whatever. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay child support. But it wasn't an option for me. So, so 17, you take, you take that full-time job, right? You ask for more hours. Are you... How does that work with school? Like, how do you, how are you managing that? It was terrible, man. I, oh gosh, I was, um, I cumed out of my too many classes and I had that meeting that no one wanted to have at the time where they said, you're going to night school. You cumed out of too many classes. And at the time, night school was like a nightmare. Like if you were in night school, man, you were either into gangs or into some, you get into a lot of fights or something. And I, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. I was cool with everyone. I wasn't a street dude, right? I didn't, I wasn't like that. So when they said night school, I was like, I just saw my life falling apart. And I begged them, like, don't let me go to night school, please. And well, I had to go to night school. And um, I finished high school, like, but not with my classmates. You know, I finished... Um, that summer. So they grad my class graduated in May and I graduated in like July or something like that. So well, it to- sounds though that um you didn't give up on school. Like you you were committed to the point where you you went and you did the night class and you actually finished. Yeah. Why? Like what what's uh, what was so valuable about school to you at the time? Like I told you, I went to the char- community day charter school and at the time that school and still is um it's they're like rated like number one over and over for like MCAS and different things. And they're very I went well- to charter school too. They're really good. Which one did you go to? Uh, community family development. Oh, you were on the street one. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we played you guys a few times in basketball. Um, I don't remember if we won, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> so education, I went to that school and where they taught, where they, where they showed us kids from Lawrence that we could do anything we wanted to do. Like they didn't put limits on us. Like, from what I've heard now as an adult and my friends who grew up in the public school system, I had a completely different experience in school. Like I said, it's almost, it was almost private-like. And the teachers would just, they, encur- they encouraged us to try things that maybe our friends weren't doing. So most of my classmates out of uh, my class was about uh, 30, let's say 30 kids. I would say about 20, 25 of them went to, ended up going to private schools, like high schools, boarding schools, including myself. I ended up going to a a very expensive, prestigious school in New Hampshire my freshman year and and a bunch of my friends did because they drive that into you in those schools. They're like, hey, you can make it to these schools. You can go to these high schools and end up going to a really good college. And, you know, they're college preparatory schools, right? So they showed us that, we had no limits that we weren't any different from our neighbors in Andover, you know, like we could do whatever we wanted. So education was huge growing up. Um, that was all the way up until eighth grade. I went to that private school my freshman year and I came back that summer after freshman year and I was 
really missing my parents and my friends. And mm. I begged my mom to not send me back. And, you know, she kind of was, she was a softie and she, she let me stay. Right. Come back. She let yeah. me stay. One of the things I do, you know, I do kind of regret is not going back to, the, to that school and finishing there. Right. Like who knows where I could have ended up, but I'm also a believer and that, you know, God makes all things work for his good. So, and I wouldn't have known Claudia, my kids and all that. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. So, um, but that's why school was so important to me because, you know, I had come from that, that really good um, grade school, uh, grammar school, and then I went to private school and then I ended up at Lawrence High. So it was just like, all right, this should be easy for me, right? I should just fly through the school and, you know, um, so that's why I didn't quit because school was important to me. Education still is. You're, you know, I think we, we were fortunate in that. And, and I feel the same way that the school that that I went to uh, never placed those limits. But I can't say that that's the case with with everyone that I've met that has grown up in Lawrence. Um, I vividly remember a buddy of mine, his uh, guidance counselor in high school basically told him, listen, you're you're aiming too high. Just just go to a community school. That's probably your best bet. You know, and it's uh, till today he's he's. Uh, He's jaded by that because, uh, you know, I, I think that the role of a, of a counselor, you know, to an extent, obviously you got to give people um, their options, but I think that, you know, there, there's, there's something to be said about having somebody that believes that, that you can do anything like, like you experienced, you know? Yeah, it, it totally did make a huge difference. I, I give them so much props when people ask me about like my success, but teachers are so important in children's lives, man. Teachers, 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 they should be getting paid as much as doctors, if not more, like they're so pivotal in a child, in a child's um, life and um, their trajectory. So I give tons of props to community day charter school, Miss Chance, um, and Mr. LaHaye, those people, man, they changed my life around, honestly. And uh, most, I, I still give them credit for most of my knowledge, education, like history, like I'm a history, like nerd. So I love history. Most of that, got sparked in that school, right? And I learned it in that school, you know, uh, American history, uh, African history, um, you know, uh, all kind of history. So I just, they made me a better person or a better child. So, um, that That's why I finished school. So, and because, geez, I was about to have a child, man. And I was so close <laughs> to having a degree. Like, I might as well finish. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but. so you finished high school. Um, are you guys, do you guys move out on your own after high school? Are you working full time? Are you living with your parents, her parents? Like, what does that yeah. look like for you? Right. So I ended up moving in with her because, um, okay. you know, she was a young, going to be a young mother um, and she was scared <laughs> and she wanted to be with her mom. Right. So I had to respect that. But I wanted to be with her. Was that an issue? Like, how does that even, like, how does that conversation even happen? Is it like, I don't even remember how it hey, happened. We're having a kid, we're moving in together, or like. Right, no, like, I think we talked about it and whether um, we talked about moving to my, either my house or living, or her living with me or me living with her at her house. And it just made more sense. Um, she was so, we were so young. She was so young. She needed her mom. Like, she needed to be there with her mom. Her mom had, was amazing and still is amazing till this day. Um, and the amount of help that she gave us, you know, as young parents. So, yeah, I moved in with her and, you know, I didn't, I couldn't afford an apartment yet. You know, I was barely getting the hours I needed. So, so we, yeah, I, I lived with her and we, that's what we tried to do. We lived together and until the baby was born and then we, we, um, we still lived together after the baby was born. <laughs> yeah. Um, it wasn't a difficult conversation. We knew we were, we wanted to be together. So, was that was that tough for you? Living now, you know, with well, now your mother in law because I don't think you guys are married at the time, but was that was that transition easy, difficult? Sorry. Are you okay? I wanna come in the room. You in the room. Sorry. I'm in I'm in our bedroom right now. So my wife oh, is gotcha. you can come in the bedroom. Go ahead. <laughs> I asked him to stay out. So it was, I don't remember what it was. I don't think it was too hard. Um, I, yeah, it wasn't that difficult. I still was in my house every day, right? So I slept in there, but I was at home every day. And we were very close, you know, um, 
you know, she was close with kind of my mom and I was close to her mom kind of to a certain degree. So we, it was, we just lived between both houses, but we, we slept at her house. But So you guys kind of made it work. It seems, it sounds like, which is fortunate because it doesn't always happen, but it sounds like for the most part, like the family was like, all right, like these kids are having a baby or right. they're having right. babies. So let's try to figure this whole thing out together. Yeah, they were, everyone was, was, you know, it was, well, no, it was devastating. But after the devastation, you know, after you kind of let the emotion play out, then it's like, all right, well, they're having a baby. <laughs> like, let's help them out. Let's support them. Mm. That's what it became. My mom, she fell in love with the baby, you know, right away. And, um, you know, my dad was the one who was most disappointed in me, um, but he got over it too. So and what was he going to do? I'm, I mean, I was, the baby was going to be born when I was 18. Right. So yeah. that, you know, that's like the age where it's like, you can't tell me what to do. So I don't know. I kind of <laughs> had that on him. Like, like that really like, what can you really do? Cause I'm going to be 18 when the baby's born and right. nothing you can do. So um, it was cool. It was n- not, not really a lot of drama with that. So how do you go? So obviously there's a lot of stuff going on. So how do you get into filming? I'm sure that it wasn't right away. It sounds like maybe you worked quite a bit. Like when does film kind of come into the picture for you? Jeez. Yeah. Many, many, many years later. So I kind of have to tell a little bit of the story in order for you to kind of, we can get to that. Mm -hmm. So when my daughter was one, Right after she turned one, we we split. Claudia and I we split. We um we just didn't know what we were doing, and we kind of hated each other for a certain time because we didn't. We were young parents, and just we couldn't take it anymore, and we split. And I went back to my house, and she lived at her house. That started a really dark time in my life. Really dark. Really, I started discovering things that I never was into um, before that. Um, you know, I never, I, I mean, I had never touched any drugs. I had never touched any, you know, alcohol. Um, I'd never um, been with too many, you know, a lot of girls either. Claudia was, um, you know, one of my, you know, first encounters, you know, so like it wasn't, I wasn't known to be out there in the streets like that. But when we broke up, things got crazy for me in my life, right? So, I'm kind of wilding out, you know, I'm trying to live it up. Like, cause I've been with this girls throughout my high school. <laughs> She's like making faces at me. <laughs> I've been with, I've been with her. I was with her, you know, throughout most of high school. So I was like, man, I didn't date anyone else. Like this is time to experiment. This is time to try, try out new things. And, oh boy, was that a terrible <laughs> mistake um, to just go out and try to live it up because I don't know. I was trying to fill a void that only, you know, uh, God could fill. But at the time I was looking for it in women, you know, I looked for it in, um, I looked for it in just streets, like kind of clubbing and parties and things like that. Um, I, uh, you know, got a little bit into, you know, uh, smoking marijuana for a certain time, not never a big person into that, but I tried it out a few times. Um, and I was just really lost, man really lost for, for many, for a few years um, after me and her split up. So was Claudia your compass? Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just kidding. Um, I thought you said something else. No, uh, we didn't know. We didn't, we weren't chat Like we were bad. Like I couldn't even, she couldn't even see me. Like if I walked in, into that house, like it was baby mama drama. That, that's what it was. Right. So it was drama and we were two immature, young, broken kids. Right. With a baby that had to somehow make it work for the rest of our lives, right? Because we have a child together. And man, it was just a lot of drama, a lot of bull crap, a lot of, man, cops getting called, like, it was ugly. That, that in itself is a whole nother testimony. But point is, I had a really dark period after we broke up where I was just doing not so good things. Um, then, I started having an encounter with God. I started looking for God. Um, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know if, how much you talk about God in this podcast. No, that's fine, man. Part of my that's testimony. Story. You can share. So I um, started looking for God because I was going through depression at the time and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't even know it was called depression. I know now, but I was depressed. I had severe anxiety. 
I was in a hospital every day thinking I was dying, telling the doctors, hey, I'm dying. I'm telling you, I, something's wrong with me, you know. And they didn't know what was wrong with me. And I was in a very dark depression, deep depression. So thankfully, God reached out to me um, in a certain way, which I'm not going to talk about now. But through certain people, I started looking for God. At the same time, she started looking for God in her on her own without me knowing and without her knowing about me, right? So we kind of came together, started talking, and through our conversations, we're like, oh, wait a minute, you're going to church now? Oh, yeah, me too. I started visiting a friend's church, and I'm kind of praying now. I don't know what this is really about, but it's helping me. It's helping my anxiety. It's helping my depression. We, so then that kind of brought us back together. Um, and eventually we got back together. And by the time we got back together, we were both um, – searching for God and just looking for answers and things. And eventually um, I, you know, gave my all to God and that's when I got married. We got married and um, we got married and my life started changing and looking better and better. And, you know, I stopped looking at things from the street, stopped obviously dealing with other women. And um, how old are you at this time when you guys get married? So, we had Annalyn, right? She was the first one. We had her when we were in high school. Then when we got back together, she, we, um, she, we got pregnant again. So with our second child, and she's 10, that's Avery. Um, we wanted to do it the right way, but you know we were still kind of screwed up kids and we wanted to try to wait till, till we got married, but we didn't. Um, so we had Avery and then we got married when Avery was a little baby. And then we had our third child. Um, in 2015. So by then we were married. We were both hev heavily in church and, and in the faith and in the walk. And that's when I discovered filmmaking. Up until then, I was just working <clears throat> kind of random jobs. You know, just I was smart enough to get hired in most entry job places, right? Um, I, any job I applied to, I can pretty much get. Um, did you ever give give a college a try or I did yep I, I did I went I went back to college so around that time after I found God um, I went back to college and that's when I discovered filmmaking so I was in college um, mm. and I discovered this new passion which led me eventually to drop out of college because I was miserable <laughs> you know especially in what I was doing was um, like human service work um, social it's just I enjoyed it, but not, I didn't think I want to do it for the rest of my life. Oh, so it wasn't like you were taking like a film course or something like that? Nope. No, I was going to school to be, to become uh, like a, maybe a social worker one day, something in that field. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Yeah. A Spring, have you, Springfield College. Uh, they have oh. a, uh, um, so I was going to Springfield College and at the time I entered the talent show um, at our church. And I decided to try to make a movie. You know, my, my wife laughed at me. She's like, what do you mean make a movie? My, my daughter, they were both laughing at me. I remember in the car when I told them, hey, I'm going to make a movie for the talent show. And I don't know why. Like, oh, yeah, I did. I had prayed about it the night before. I asked God, God, give me an idea for the talent show. I usually sing because that's what I do. I, I do music. My God, I skip so much. I'm a musician, <laughs> man. I, I, I was I was almost signed at a certain point in my life. And there's just so much to my story. Sorry, man. So I made the movie, right? And I showed it in church and everybody clapped and people cried and things like that. But and when do you, do you find the filming? Like when does that, I know that you mentioned that it, it was in college, but when do you actually start experimenting or thinking about like, was it a film? Was it somebody you met that was playing around with the program? Like, how do you, how are you like, you know what, film, this is kind of cool. Let me just play with it. Or what was it the talent show? Like, how was the, It was a talent show, right? Oh, so okay, gotcha. I was known for, for doing worship, singing, right? But I told God, I want to do something different for this talent show. I need you to give me something. The next day, I woke up with an idea to make a movie. I, did, I went on YouTube really quick. I'm like, man, is this possible? Did a little bit of research. You know what? I think I can do it. I can borrow a camera from this place. I can um, download this free editing program and I can 
put it all together. And I did it in a matter of two weeks. Windows Windows Media Maker? No, it was <laughs> <laughs> That was a, that was the, the first like video editing program that I ever played with. <laughs> I think it was iMovie. I think I realized I had already because I had an Apple computer. So I think it was mm. iMovie. You're an Apple guy, huh? I'm on Apple right now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, um, I showed the movie and everybody clapped and that kind of got me going. And I'm like, all right, I, I think I'm a little good at this. Let me make another movie. And I made another one. And these are short films, right? Um, and I would show them at church and, and people would tell me, man, they're amazing. What was the movie about? What? What was the first movie about? It was about. I don't know this. Yeah, no, it was about a girl who, who lost her mom at an early age, and she blamed God for her mom dying. And it was about her kind of going through those emotions and eventually finding God and realizing that, you know, God is good no matter what. And um, that would, that, that's what it was about. And the funny thing, not funny, the crazy thing is the girl that I picked out to be in that movie, who I asked to be in that movie, that was her story. Like, that actually happened to her. You know what I'm saying? And I wasn't really aware of it and to that to that degree. Like I knew her mom had died, but I didn't know it was the exact story I had written out, right? And they were all all of the movies were similar to that, right? They were uh, just about people going through situations where eventually they would look to God to help them out of that situation, you know. So they were all kind of you know, cheesy, you know, but they were my humble beginnings, and it ministered to a lot of people. So. And it was what got me going to eventually start doing weddings. You know, um, you know, I shot your wedding, <laughs> but yeah. by then I was already well into, you know, weddings, but. Yeah, you were kind of established by then. Yeah, by then I was, but at first, you know, I started doing free weddings and, and charging, you know, five, maybe 300 and 400 and, you know, you work your way up, but that's kind of how I got started, man. I, <laughs> well, what, what put, so this is interesting because. So you're doing your regular job, right? And you're doing this thing that's a hobby and uh, you're enjoying it. Yes. What, what happens if you're like, can I make money with this? You know what I mean? Because a lot of people uh, will look at a hobby and that's what they'll, it'll just be a hobby. They won't necessarily monetize it. So, right. I mean, it takes a, I'm sure, you know, you, you mentioned that your wife and your daughter kind of laughed at you a little bit when you're like, oh, what do you mean you're going to make a movie? So, where does that courage come from where you're like, you know what, maybe I'm good enough to charge for right. what I'm doing. So that confidence came from what I was instilled, what they instilled in me as a child um, at the charter school. It goes back to that. It goes back to me feeling like I could do anything I put my mind to. Um, and I still, still to this day, I have that confidence. Like I have so many different things going on that I'm not going to discuss now, but it's things that you're like, that you would be like, really, Felix? You're doing that? Like, that's crazy. Like, well, that's, a, that's ambitious, right? But it's that confidence they instilled in me as a child. So I say teachers are so important. Um, my wife, when I told her that I wanted to start a business, um, she thought I was crazy. <laughs> like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, you made $300 on that bar mitzvah. Like, what do you, you think we can start a business off that? Mm. You know, but she didn't, other than like having her doubts, right? Cause she didn't have the same upbringing. She didn't know it was possible for us to even own a business. Like she didn't know how that worked. And so for her, it was like, whoa, this is like uncharted territory. I know nothing about this. I like my safe jobs, like, you know, 40 hour a week jobs. Like, you know, like we, we don't do this. Like we came from the hood, like you work hard and you, you still, you work for somebody else and you, you make money and you retire 401k. That's what you do, right? So this was so new to her and for me too, but it didn't scare me. Right. That's, that was a difference. And, um, so what it was, um, what was it again? So I started making a little bit of money, a few hundred dollars on, on you know, a few like little sweet 15s and, and little parties and things like that. And, but the videos were good. You know, people really liked the videos and I thought they were good. Like I thought I was good. Um, I look back now and this is like, God, I, but at the time I thought it was good. Right. And that's what I needed to keep moving forward. And one day I came to my wife with this crazy idea that God gave me. Right. And I still say it was God because it kind of led me to where I am now. And I told my wife, look, we're both working. 
but I want to take a year. I need a year. I need you to give me a year off of work. I need you to hold down the, house, the, the fort, hold down the house for a year while I try to get this business started. And if in a year we haven't seen a significant increase in, you know, the business revenue in whatever business, I didn't even have a name for the business at the time, but if I hadn't made much money in videos at the end of the year, it was a wrap for me. I'm going back to Springfield College. I got to, you know, going back to work, uh, where, wherever I was working at the time. Um, and forget about the business. And my wife, my beautiful, amazing wife, agreed to do it. She trusted. She trusted God. Not she didn't trust me. She trusted God. And so, and she was like, okay, well, we, I'll do it. And she, that's what she did. Just like that. Just like that. It wasn't. Maybe from, I waited one day, maybe. It was like an overnight thing. I told her the night before, the next day. By the next day, I already knew, all right, I'm quitting my job. And that's what I did. I, I quit my job, you know, two weeks notice, uh, whatever I did. And um, I started learning, right? Because I was still very early on in this video stuff. Like, I was crazy, bro. I'm telling you, I was months into picking up a camera, and I'm saying I'm going to make a business out of this, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just to show you the level of confidence I had at the time, I wasn't even that good. <laughs> I barely knew, <laughs> you know, the proper terms that you learn in filmmaking school or whatever. But what did I do? I, the thing also is that you don't have a college degree. Like, this is just self-taught. Self-taught. This, and, you're like, I'm gonna, and you're like, I'm going to make this work. I want to, like, I want to digest this because, you know, you said something very critical. And that is, like, that's not what we do. Like us Hispanics, like, no, you know, you, you, you go and you work for somebody else, yeah. you get your 401k and eventually you hope to retire. Right. And even like, you know, in, in our culture, I don't know how prevalent that was for you growing up, but at least for me, and I, I talk about this a lot, is that in most Hispanic households, especially with us growing up, it's uh, you go to school, you get a degree, and that's going to set you up to go work for somebody else. And that's your path, you know? Yeah. So... For you to do this, I don't, I don't want people to miss, like, this is big because that's not what we're taught. Right. Like, that's not, like, a thing. Like, business is not a thing for the most part. Right. Unless, like, you're, in, you're already, the family already has a business or something. Mm-hmm. Like, for the most yeah. part, it's not something that, you know, we're taught or, you know, we're even offered the opportunity. Like, hey, this can really, you can actually do this, you know. Um, I never had a filmmaker come to my school, you know, uh, and tell me, Hey, you can do this. Right. Like, no, like that didn't happen in the hood at least, you know? So it, it was big, right. It was. And that's why my wife was so kind of shocked at first. Um, but man, we were just in the right situation. Like our rent was just low enough that we could just kind of live off of her income for that year and whatever else. You guys, I could- had, a, you guys had a sacrifice, huh? We did. We did have to sacrifice. We did. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We did. Um, Cause like you're going on, on one income and you're like getting maybe 300 bucks a gig. So like, and I'm barely getting gigs. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> did you guys have like a lot of money saved up? Like, did you prepare for this? Or it was kind of like, Hey, your job will kind of cover the bills. I'm going to try to help out where I can. And uh, you want to give this a try? The money I made, we spent it on my first camera. <laughs> like the, the, the money, like the money we had saved up, actually. Yeah, actually, we had a little bit of money saved up, like an emergency account. Not much in it, but it was enough to buy a camera that I needed. And that was hard. That was hard for my wife to kind of like let go and be like, oh, wow. Like our safety net, really, God, like I'm going to trust him with this. And, um, and she did. She did eventually. But she saw me. I was busting my butt every day getting educated i didn't even go right into like trying to get a lot of jobs i wanted to get educated because i knew that there were there was so much information that i didn't know there was i didn't go to film school right i didn't go to business school so i need to get educated and what was available to me books and youtube that's all i had and that's all i needed to get to get started and really to get to where i am now like everything i learned YouTube University, man, and just persistence and, and hard work and making mistakes. Um, so you thank God for my career choice, 
um, video production, you don't need a college degree. Sure, a lot of people do get them, you know, but a lot of people don't as well. So I was blessed enough or lucky enough to end up doing something that didn't require, you know, like I couldn't come to Claudia and be like, hey, I'm going to open up a, you know, a law office or something, right? Because what am I going to do? Uh, be the reception and hire a lawyer, you know, I just, <laughs> right? Because I, but this with hard work and determination and not giving up, I was able to build the business up slowly, little by little, right? Um, like I mentioned, um, doing the weddings. And that's really where I got really known. And that's where I really got established. And it was like making decent money, you know, um, when I started getting into weddings, because I learned everything, everything I could learn about filmmaking and making cinematic wedding videos. And my, my goal was always to make a better video than the last one, right? Um, my last, my next wedding has to look better than my last one. And when you have that attitude, you know, you, you challenge yourself and you try to do better and you do different things. And so that, that was my mentality for the first few years of, of starting that business. So Were you doing weddings from the beginning? Was that like I your really brother? Or? I did my first wedding within the first year of me picking up a camera. So, um, yeah, I did, um, a few weddings, I did, I did a free one first and from there, 200, 300. And, um, yeah, I was, I guess there weren't that many people doing wedding films at the time because mm -hmm. I became really popular. <laughs> like I became really known around Lawrence for that. Um, and yeah, that kind of, that helped me out a lot that I was one of the only people doing it and doing it to the capacity, I guess I was doing it and not to my own horn, but I took my stuff very serious. You know, um, you hired me for a reason, I guess, right? Because yeah. you saw the level of work I provided, right? And that was my goal. Like I wanted to show super professionalism, like coming right here from Lawrence. Like this is right here in Lawrence. This is a professional filmmaking company, wedding film at the time it was just weddings. Right. Um, and yeah, that was my goal, man, just to be the best, just trying to be better, better. And I don't know. Was, was that you choosing um, weddings? Was that, was that luck or were you strategic about that? At first, it was kind of just uh, luck, right? It was my friend. He was a photographer, Jufi. I, I mentioned him. He was shooting a wedding. He's been a, he was a photographer for many years, even before that. So he said, he saw that I started doing videos. And he's like, hey, why don't you come with me, bring your camera, and just start recording? And if anyone asks you, just say you're my assistant. Like, you know, because I had, a, at the time, a camera that looked like a, video, a photo camera. So they didn't know what I was doing. I was recording. They thought I was taking pictures. And he's like, look, at the end of the night, you're going to run home. You're going to edit this video really quick. And then you're going to come back here and you're going to present it to them and see what they say and see if they want to buy it off you. And that's what I did. That was my first wedding. It was just like that. I ran home. It was about eight o'clock and they, they finished doing all the major things of the wedding. I ran home. I put the wedding video together. I brought it back. I knocked on their door and I'm like, hey, remember me? Yeah, I was with Jufi all day. Um yeah, can you put this DVD in here? I just want to show you what I did. <clears throat> and um, they loved it. And and I was honestly good, willing to give it to them for free just for the experience, but they paid me. They, uh, they gave me money. They gave me like 200 bucks. And that was kind of the start of everything. And I was just like, whoa, okay, <laughs> weddings. So that that's when I started getting really into weddings and studying wedding videos. And I would look up the best wedding videographers and I would try to imitate their moves and their shots and that little by little I started getting better and like I said um I got I started getting really known in the Lawrence kind of Christian you know circle of people like I started you know my name started getting spread and I did a ton of weddings um in a span of a few years and um eventually we shifted our our focus into more business things but yeah so, so do you do you think were you successful because of your hard work or was, or is there more to it? And, and the reason that I asked that I've, I specifically can think of a, a photographer friend of mine. Um, he did uh, the photographer thing on the side and he, um, he quit the job at the time. And I think a year or two later, he kind of couldn't sustain 
his him himself and, and his wife with that so then he went back and you know he's working back at that company i'm no longer in that company but he went back and 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 he's working there now so yeah. how what makes you different like what what made you be able to succeed because most businesses most small businesses they fail you know yeah. they they don't succeed so i'm trying to okay so here's one some of those right, nuggets from you right off the top we were living really like we were frugal, right? Our rent, we were blessed, man. We had a three bedroom. And we stayed there for eight years before buying our house. We had a three bedroom. Rent never went up. Eight fifty. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Those are like two thousand six numbers, and we had that <laughs> all throughout. You know, growing our. Um, I don't know. Eight years. We were there for eight years, and um, so we already, you know, we had low rent. You know, I think we had paid off our car already. So we didn't have that many expenses, right? So that's important. You can't be trying to ball out and have the latest stuff. And, you know, um, something I hate about our, our, our community, I feel like uh, Latino, Lawrence, Dominicans, we're very like, I don't know what the word is, but we like flashy. to, huh? Flashy? Yeah, we're very flashy, man. We be having some, I have... Man, I knew people growing up had like BMW still living with their mom, not even helping pay the rent. Like, you know what I'm saying? That kind of flashy, right? The latest Jordans, but you can't even, um, you know, pay the, the credit card back. And just that mentality, like I didn't have it, right? By then I had given my life to Christ and he kind of washed any potential, any, I might have, you know, at a certain time I was that a little bit, but I, he took that away. So at the time I was just all about my wife, my children, and just getting getting better in life, right? So we were living very frugally. Um, frugally is that even a word? Frugally, I don't know. But you lived a frugal life lifestyle. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> frugally. <laughs> um, and so that helped, right? That's number one. But that's not everything. Second thing is something that I teach everyone, anyone who wants to know about business and how to be successful and how to how to, how to make it somewhere, you know, with your own business. I always tell someone the reason most people are not, are not successful after a few years with their business is because they didn't stick with it long enough. This is assuming they have a good idea, right? This is assuming that their business is you know, a good idea, right? Cause that could be, that could be the start of the everything, right? If you, you know, if your idea sucks, I can, you're not going to go anywhere, but if you have a good idea and you, and you can stick with it through the good and the bad times, mostly bad for the first few years, eventually it's going to come back around. Like you're going to meet so many people. If you're doing the right thing, right? You're going out there, getting your face out there. You're doing good work. When you're, when you do get work, you're doing a good job. It's going to come back around. It's like, Every year you meet a certain amount of people. Eventually, after two, three, four years, those people are going to remember your name, right? If, and they're going to come back to you or they're going to send someone your way. And, but that, only, that can only happen if you don't give up. You have to go through those rough years. You have to, man. You have to sacrifice. And thank God, my wife, again, she was still working. That year turned into more than a year. She held on the house for longer than a year uh, before I started making real money. The reason after the year she didn't make me quit and go back to school and work was because I was starting to show like, you know, okay, this, this mm -hmm. might, there's some potential here. Right. So she let it go on longer. And man, I remember when we got our first thousand dollar job, my wife was shocked. Like she could not believe we just made a thousand dollars off a of video. Like, <laughs> you know, and that, that was a turning point for her. That's when I got her really on board like, with me. Like, okay, I'm going to help you. Like, let's do this like together. Right. So you asked me, right. So, um, about how, how did you succeed, man? How did I succeed? Right. So not giving up. That was huge. Right. Not giving up, um, being persistent and you gotta, you gotta, I think you gotta love what you do. Um, I know there's so many people who open businesses and they don't necessarily love it and they're successful because they're just really smart. I'm smart, but I'm not that smart where I can do 
something I don't enjoy doing and make a good living. Like, no, the reason I'm where I am now is because I enjoy what I, what I do for work. I, it doesn't feel like work. So that's huge. That's something else that I preach all the time. Like if you can, like if you're not happy at work, if you don't enjoy, if work feels like work, consider making a, a, a career change. Even if you're in your thirties, like me, like I, 30s, 40s, 50s, I don't care how old you are. Um, if you're not happy doing what you do, I don't think it's worth it, man. Like <laughs> just working all the way till we're what, 65? Like life expectancy is what, 75? You got 10 years to enjoy. Like, no, <laughs> no, you need to enjoy what you do so it doesn't feel like work, you know? So that's something else. I guess that's the third nugget that I have. Okay. Well, I think that it's, I think you hit on some, some great points. And first, I don't want to dismiss what you said about your wife because um dude that's that's super key like you can't you can't be going one direction and your partner going on a different direction it's just it's never gonna work so that's like foundational on all levels Absolutely. so i think that like that's super important it would have never worked without her think about it i, I this never would have happened if she yeah. would have no i need you to work and she would have been in all her right mind to tell me man we got kids man get go back to work you know <laughs> And the persistence part, I think it's so important to emphasize that, especially today, man, because, I mean, we both go to church, you know, we both, I don't know if you lead any youth classes, but, you know, I do. And, and I meet so many uh, young kids, man, that just want things to happen, like, exactly. yesterday, and, like, that's not how the world works, man. I mean, there's there's some people, man, that they strike gold, but... More, more often than not, you're going to have to grind and grind for a bit before you see some real results. Build up. What you're doing is building the foundation, like when you're grinding, because like most things that come easy, they leave easy. And I, I've learned that so much through many times in my life. Like if it came fast, man, that thing can leave fast. Like you it got no roots, it got no roots to it, man. You didn't learn what you were supposed to learn during those hard times, right? That's why people who win the lottery, most of them go broke within like a year, two years. They're bankrupt like because they don't know how to manage money. They didn't work hard for that, right? So, I don't know. Well, you're, you're building character too. Like right. those years are, are building that character yeah. that's going to help you. Like with more success, right, comes greater problems. But if you didn't go through that process, right, to get to where you are, then – those big problems, they're, they're going to tear you down. Absolutely. So you're building that, that foundation. And I think that's, that's so important. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Not persistence, man. It's, uh, you, you talk to any successful person, like real successful. Like I'm just like sort of successful. I'm talking about like millionaires, billionaires, and they will tell you that would be on their top list of, you know, how they got to where they got to was just not giving up. Simple as that. Not simple, it's hard, but you know, not giving up, man. You know, the, the funny thing that, that you, um, just hearing how you kind of got, how you got started and um, how you, you went through your process, like you didn't overcomplicate the situation. Like you weren't like, oh, what does it even mean to have a business? How am I gonna pay like my taxes? Like your thing was, go, go, I like go. videos. <laughs> I need to make some money. <laughs> Let me start there. Because yeah, I feel like so many start. people just get too ahead of themselves and they just, they don't start. Bro, if I would have, someone would have shown me a business plan my first year and told me I needed to do this before starting to work, I would have quit. <laughs> I can't look at a business plan now. And I got several businesses now going on. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, bro, yes. I, my wife always says this. Like, I'm the go, go, go guy, right? Like, I will quit if I don't go. Like, let me go first. Let me get my feet wet. And then, okay, we got to okay, we gotta look at everything and get it organized and, and become legal and all this stuff. Yeah, of course. But at first, let me just get my feet wet. Let me see how this feels. Let me make sure I want to do this, right? So, yeah, that's, I'm, that's funny you picked up on that. So, you said becoming legit and having a business plan. So, somebody that's, like, listening to our conversation, right, has never thought about building a business, but maybe they, they are trying to. And obviously we talked about don't get stuck in all the details, just get started. 
but what are some of the, like the simple things that somebody should do? Like, obviously like you got to pay your taxes, you know, uh, maybe an LLC might be in order at some point. Like what are some of the few steps that somebody should consider if they're trying to start their own business, their own small business? So I'll tell you what I did. This is what I did when I, I was a year into this business and I hadn't legalized anything. It was just me saying, Hey, I have a business, right? That's all it was. It was just me saying, Hey, I have a business. And I made a little cheap logo and Hey, this is me. But I knew, all right, you got to start, you know, you're making some money now you pass kind of the threshold of, I think it was a, you know, certain a few hundred dollars a year where you got to start reporting it now. And, you know, so I didn't know what to do. I didn't go to, I didn't go to business school. I didn't have any mentors at the time. Right. Cause that's huge. That's important. If you can get a mentor, I didn't have any mentors though. So what did I do? I drove down to city hall. I walked into the clerk's office, whatever you call it. And I, you know, I said, Hey, um, I started a business and I don't know what steps to take to make it legal. And you know, I, I need help. Like, can you guide me? Oh, of course, honey. You know, came through with all the paperwork. This is what you got to do. Fill this out, fill this out. You got to go to this room. You got to go to that room. They told me everything I have to do. You got to go open up a bank account. What are you going to be? An OC, sole proprietor? Okay, no. Uh, what's that? I don't know. I don't even know what that is. You know, they explained it to me. So what I'm saying is ask. Don't be afraid to ask. So many people, they get You went stuck. to City Hall? I went to City Hall, man, and I asked the lady. Ooh, that's, so, that's so, like, different. So we, we have an LLC for, like, the properties that we own and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But like, that's so funny that you literally, you drove to CD Hall. And you're like, Hey, <laughs> I'm I, starting I a business. Too. I tried Google and it was just giving me too many, you know, conflicting things and different answers. Uh, and I like, oh, man, I need to know how they do it here in my city. So I went to Lawrence, I went to city hall and I said, Hey, help. Like I've never done this before. Walk me through it. And they gave me a bunch of papers and they say, they said, fill this out and, and go here and go here and go here. And within a matter of two days, I was a business, a legit business, right? Over it really, way. it really isn't that difficult. Like, I think like we were looking at like all the paperwork that you had to do. And I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. Cause I think you like overthink a lot of it. Yeah. Really. You just, I mean, you, you filled out the paperwork, but you go online, you register your LLC. There's a few, I mean, they even have YouTube videos at this point on how to do that. Right. And then after that, you just, you know, you'll get your, um, your ID for your company and then you go you use that to open up an account and from there you know you got to renew every year but Look, you're off it's it's not the easiest thing in the world but it's not hard and if you can't fathom if you can't build the energy to do this this first step right like maybe you need to rethink <laughs> you know owning a business because you know <laughs> it, it's gonna get harder <laughs> so. i mean the accounting and how that works like that's a whole nother ball game right. tracking right. the income and expenses it is it is but if you have the right people around you you know like you can't do it all you have yeah. to know that yeah you can't get turbo tax but you're gonna miss out on a lot of things right <laughs> a lot of yeah. money out there a lot of you know um you need the right people around you don't be afraid to spend a little money like with an accountant and you know cpa or whatever a professional do your tax <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i don't play that i've yo i've never played that like our taxes i've always been terrified of the government the irs so <laughs> as soon as like we hit like that around the year the one year mark we've been filling out our taxes you know as a business uh, we were a sole proprietor for a long time but you know we don't mess around with that don't ever don't ever screw around with the irs <laughs> ever <laughs> so they'll come they'll get you one way or another uh yeah they will they, and honestly you know, they tell you, oh, you know, you can get audited, make sure all your stuff is straight. And I never really paid attention to that. I'm like, you know, I'd never gotten audited. I got audited last year, right? Mm, yeah. We had to have all our stuff, all our numbers right, you know? Um, and thank God we had a system that, you know, we use an accounting software system. And my wife, she's the one that works that. And, you know, it was, it was all ready. It was good. So when she gave it to them, everything made sense, you know? So, Yeah. So you're not doing weddings anymore, though. Oh, God. So what, what, when, when does that transition happen? Your business grew, you know, you're evolving. I think that's and also important to, to see. It's crazy because I was at the peak of my wedding, wedding career, wedding video career, when I decided to shift gears. I was at my peak, man. The wedding films I was making, man, 
I go back and watch them now and I, I cry sometimes. Like they're that good, right? <laughs> um, and I was making good money. I was charging a decent amount of money by the time I, I, I was going to um, shift gears. And I, I didn't have to shift gears. I could have continued just shooting weddings. But I fell in love with like commercial filmmaking during that time. I started discovering like, like I started getting bored with weddings, to be honest. That's what happened. I started getting bored with weddings. They were kind of all the same thing, you know, that my creativity wasn't just flowing as much. I was like, man, why am I bored? Like I need to do something else. I started doing research on commercial filmmaking, like talking about like Nike commercials and just commercials in general. Like how do you get into that field? How do you start doing that? That looks hard. Like that was a big challenge. Like that was scary to me. But I started looking into it and I saw that there was a need for businesses that, you know, so many people, so many businesses had websites, right? Almost everyone, almost every business now has a website. What do those websites need? They need videos. They need content, right? So I, that's what I built the next part of my business on. It was business, um, working with businesses that needed um, commercials or just explainer videos for their websites. Um, I, yeah, I lost passion for weddings and I wanted to go cold turkey um, with, you know, with, with switching over. Um, also because in my field, there's a level of, it's, it's a weird kind of um, attitude towards wedding filmmakers, <laughs> believe it or not, right? Um, they're not res as respected because mm. oh you do weddings oh <laughs> yeah you know what i'm saying like it's weird right it's so stupid right so i had to remove all my wedding stuff from my website because i didn't want to get i was afraid of getting that image right like i wanted to be respected as a commercial filmmaker and that's what i put my head to i mean you know what no I, that's that's what i want to do so i'm gonna stop doing weddings completely um and that's what i did i stopped and it was hard. I lost a lot of money that first year. Oh, gosh. It was so hard. So you weren't, like, there wasn't even a process. You just stopped. I stopped, man. I stopped. Really? I stopped. Um, and I started focusing on getting commercial jobs, businesses. I started meeting with businesses. Hey, look at this one. I did, uh, I did a few free ones. And then from, I took that and I showed it to everyone else. I'm like, this is what I can do. Um, pay me. Like, you know, <laughs> you need this. Um, it was hard that first year. Oh my goodness. Cause you don't have, I didn't have them that, that many examples on my website of commercials, right? Most of my stuff was weddings. And if I removed all the weddings, I only had about three free videos I did for commercials, which weren't that good. Right. They weren't that good. Cause they were my first like business videos. Um, but it got me started. It got me into another door. And then I'd show that one, the, the latest one to the uh, next potential client. How did, how did you get clients? Like, were you just knocking door to door? Were you searching local businesses on and Google? Like when I went cold Turkey, man, I'm so proud of saying this because I feel so old school when I say this, man, man, I went to Essex street. I parked my car in the beginning of Essex street. I grabbed my flyers. I grabbed my business card and I walked. I knocked, Door to door, every business down Essex Street, every business up and down. You know how long Essex Street is. Then I went down Broadway. Then I went down Common. I gave everyone my business cards. And one of those businesses said, you know what? Yeah, I'll give you a chance. I don't know if you know. Uh, one. 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 Um, let, me, let me come, I think they're called. They're a small cell phone uh, an accessory store in, on Essex Street. So random, man. Uh, the guy, he, he, he looked at a few things I had done that really weren't that good. And he gave me a chance. He said, I'll do it. I'll, I'll pay you. I forgot how much it was, but it was a decent amount of money, if, a few hundred bucks. And I was like, you know, yeah, it's much less than what I was making in weddings. But, hey, I'm starting something new here. And they're willing to pay me for it. So let's do it. <laughs> and uh, I shot that one commercial, that one what I call it a commercial, but it never, it didn't go on TV. Um, and yeah, I just kept going from there. I would do the same thing somewhere else. And eventually word of mouth is what really got me going. Right. Cause mm -hmm. I go back to, you want to do a great job for all of your clients, even the ones that don't pay much because they're going to tell someone else about you who might have a bigger budget. Right. So my wife has always taught, we've always talked about this cause you, you 
with those free clients or those really low paying clients, sometimes our flesh, right? <laughs> our nature, like we, we don't really want to put in as much effort. Like, uh, like, uh, to get, let's just get this out the way. Yeah. All right. Come on. Yeah. Action. Like, and I, I learned my lesson actually, because I did do that a few times and it's like, no, that's not okay. You need to give them the same kind of work that you would give a, a high paying client, you know, because you don't know what, who's going to see their video and you know how that's going to come back to you. So, um, was your wife on board the second time around for this as well? Or did she think you were crazy? She was. She was on board after she saw that. Remember I mentioned that first $1,000 that I made? Mm -hmm. uh, it was, her shock wasn't so much $1,000 that I made it um, just by doing making a video. Because we I had made more than that making weddings. But it was a fact that a business was willing to pay me $1,000 to shoot a commercial for them. She didn't think that that wasn't a sustainable thing. She didn't believe, she didn't think it wasn't even a, an actual business, right? So that's why she was on board. Cause she saw that first thousand dollars hit the bank and she was like, okay, this is real. People are actually willing to pay for this. And after that, I just, I mean, I never quit, man. I didn't quit. My wife kept, um, she, oh no, you know what? My wife wasn't working at the time cause she had a baby. We had a, we had a child and she stopped, she stopped working. So now all the pressure was on, right? Um, at the time to show you, like sometimes through adversity, you have to shift. You have to, you have to be able to move and think on your feet. Like, okay, you're not just going to drop all this Felix. You've been working on this business for a few years now. You're not just going to leave it. Right. Like I was faced with having to do something, right. Cause my wife stopped working. She couldn't work because of, um, my, my child, he had a really bad, um, what was it called? Colic or I don't know what it's called. Just like acid stuff. He would, he couldn't. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Nah. The milk. Yeah. 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 So she couldn't work, man. And I was faced like, Oh man, am I, is this really the end of vessel vision? Like I'm going to have to find a job. I'm going to have to go back to work full time. And man, God opened the door. Someone, um, a teacher, I know, um, principal. I don't know. I was hit up by a uh, school. They were looking for, a teacher to come in and teach kids how to film, um, how to do like movies and stuff, do like a filmmaking class. And I started working, man. I did. A, I got a little part time at the Arlington School, being a, um, teaching kids after school. You know, um, it was a filmmaking class. It was called Lights, Camera, Action, and that held me down right for a while because I was still, you know, I was still building up my business kind of side of the, uh, my business videos. You know, that I wasn't making too much money with that. And my wife had quit. So that kind of helped out in the meanwhile. So I was making a little bit of money with Vessel Vision and I was making a little bit of money with the teacher position. So that should just, I guess what I'm, the reason I'm saying this is because some people would think like, ew, I'm not going back to working for anybody else. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm already a business owner, you know? And I have, I dealt with a little bit of that, right? I was like, man, do I really want to do this? But that was able I was able to keep my business afloat because that was after school hours, right? I was only working there a few hours a day in the evening and afternoon. So I still had my regular daytime schedule where I was working on my business. And then I would go and work at the Arneson school. So that helped me out for a, um, a certain amount of time. And um, now where was I? I don't know, I'm lost. No, I'll tell you, man, uh, that takes a lot of self-awareness for you to be able to uh, just go, well, twice, right? You went from working your regular job to saying, I like this film stuff. I love yeah. it, actually. I want to make weddings and I want to try to make money at this and I can do this. So, and obviously, you know, we've talked about your faith and like, I'm sure that that played a huge role in you, yeah. you know, trusting God in, in this case to, to be able to carry you through, you know, these times, you know, where you were trying this, this new stuff. Not only that, man, but like, you know, we've talked about like the perseverance that's, that's also key. But I think that one of the things you mentioned that, that, um, that I want to kind of focus on is like the ego, like, you know, you were making good money yeah. with the, um, weddings. with, with the weddings. And then now to, cause like, you're almost starting over. Like you can't, you're not this big boss because commercial is, it's a whole nother game. And I'll tell you, there's people that can't get over that and yeah. they're not willing to go back to be the lowest guy in the totem pole to be able to do something that they love again. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's something that 
a lot of people could learn a lot from because, you know, we're, we're men, you know, that ego, bro, <laughs> that ego can get in the way. Just think about it. Everyone knows me. Oh, Felix is a business owner. Yeah, yeah. Man, he works for himself. Like, oh, that's so cool. To then like, oh yeah. Oh, you worked at Arlington, Felix? Oh, I saw you. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, that kind of for a man, right? Because you're already, I'm so proud of what I've already accomplished. But now I kind of gotta go take a few steps back and kind of humble myself. And this is what I gotta do. You know, it was either find a full-time job and have to stop my soul vision or do this, right? work hard time here, keep the business going. So that ego, yeah, you got to get that ego out of the way, man. That, gosh, yeah. But I think it's also like your focus, dude. Like at the end of the day, it's like you had your focus. Like, you know, I'm sure it's going to be, I don't want to say embarrassing, but I'm sure that if somebody asks you like, oh, what you up to, you know, you got to be like, oh yeah, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing class at the Arlington. But like in the back of your mind, I'm sure what kept you going is like, dude, I got to focus and I know where I want to be. And having the confidence that you're taking the right steps to get there. Oh, man, I remember meeting people, even like people I went to high school with, who their their kids would be at the Arlington. And I'd be like, crap, like, you know, like, I'm just kind of here. I'm like a little, you know, like, I don't know, after school teacher, like, hey, Felix. Oh, hey. Yeah, no, I'm just, yeah, I'm here. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I, uh, I'm a film teacher. <laughs> like, you know, I would try to boost my ego with that. Like, man, be quiet, man. You go after school teacher, like, come on, stop it. Like it, it was tough. There, there were moments where it was like, man, like I would almost want to throw in their face. Like, yeah, I work here, but I got a business. Like, mm. but I didn't do that. Cause that's not my character. Right. That's stupid. Like you're just, you're trying too hard at that point. Like you. Just, <laughs> you know, I just took it in the chin, man. I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. I'm, happy as well and i was having fun there too it was, it was fun it was filmmaking right so i was having fun with these kids um and yeah so you gotta we gotta humble ourselves down sometimes I'm many times. I, I was talking to a buddy of mine you know doing one of these interviews and he went from um <clears throat> const he he had a, a, a short career in uh, music he had mm -hmm. a band and stuff like that they toured all around europe etc and then he did construction. And then at, at 25, um, he has to move back in with his parents. And he lived with them for five years with his wife and a baby. And at 30, he decides to get into IT. You know, and now, you know, he's in 36 years later, he's doing pretty well for himself. But it wasn't like this straight line for him to be where he's at. He had to some, sometimes move around. And it's so funny because I think that there's, there's people that look at an obstacle that's straight ahead and they never think to go around or mm -hmm. to go sideways, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they just, they see this obstacle, they can't get, they can't get over it. So then they stop. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like your, your story is just, it's one where I go back, I keep on thinking in my head, like when, when you said, do what you love, because once you, you had your passion for, for, for weddings, and I'm sure that you loved it for a time. And I was, I was talking to this other guy who's an entrepreneur, and he's, he, there was a point where he was a CEO of this company, right? And he quit to start something fresh and brand new. And what he said was that I solved the Rubik's Cube. Like, it just, it wasn't interesting anymore. Like, I could do it in my sleep. I needed a new challenge. Right. And I think that there's so many people that end up being miserable because they just continue knowing that, you know, that uh, they're just not interested anymore because they, they love that security. So, I mean, kudos to you, man, to be able to have the self-awareness to recognize, like, listen, like, I'm, I'm, I'm able to provide for my family. I'm doing well, but that passion is not there anymore, you know? Yeah. That, again, I, I kudos to my wife. Like, again, she, she, I couldn't have done anything without her approval because, like you said, two heads, if we're separated, you know, looking in different directions, we're going to fail. We're going to crash. Right. So the fact that she gave me the freedom to try to make all these changes and we're talking about grown adults, man. We were, you know, twenties, late twenties with kids. Like we got kids, man. We were married. We had bills. We had goals that we wanted to reach. And I'm here trying to make these crazy decisions. Like, well, what may seem crazy to someone. Um, so I really do appreciate my wife, man. You need a, a if you're gonna, if you're married, or if you're single, man, I encourage you to, you know, 
don't don't be afraid of marriage, man. Like if you find the right person, they're gonna make you better. <laughs> so, you know, just throwing that little thing out there. But gotta make sure it's the right person, right? Oh gosh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But uh, I was thinking about the humbling thing again. Like there's more there was more humbling that happened afterwards. So and I kinda wanna mention it. So I was working at the school, right? And thank God, little by little, Vessel Vision started building up and word of mouth. It was all word of mouth. One business would tell another business, yeah, hey, look at my video. Oh, who made that video for you? It was Vessel Vision. They would call me, hey, we want you to make our video. It came to the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm making enough money that I can stop working at the Arlington, you know? And that time came. And, you know, it was, it was bittersweet. The kids, you know, uh, goodbye. Um, but they were, you know, my boss is there. They, you know, they were very encouraging. They were happy for me. They knew what my goal was. They knew I had best the whole time. They knew I was there temporarily, you know, until I can get back on my feet until I can get my solution to a point where it's, it's making money again. And um, so I got to that point and I was starting to make some decent money. Um, like similar to like the wedding days, just with businesses though. So it's different now. I have my weekends, right? Cause that was another reason why I didn't want to do weddings anymore. My weekends were, I was spending them with other people, you know, and not <laughs> my children, right? So I had my weekends back. Um, commercial filmmaking is different, here. you know. It's 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 more money, it's more it's more money and a little bit less work, you know. It's um it's more about strategy, you know. Um, so it was it was different, and I was happy. And um, I had a plateau though, where I felt like I kind of didn't know what to do. I had learned, you know, as much as I, not, not as much as I could have, but I didn't know what else to learn. I didn't know how to, I felt stuck. Like, how do I break this barrier of like whatever I was making? You know, this is, I've only, I've been making this amount for a while now and I don't know how to break past the, and if I can recall, I want to say it was the three, three to 5,000 range. I hadn't really broken that yet. Like I, you know, and in the industry I was in, you know, I was part of a lot of Facebook groups and, you know, for filmmakers and all that. So I knew people were making way more money, you know, making commercials, like way more. So like, what am I doing wrong? Like, yeah, I, I get it. I live in Lawrence and, you know, it's kind of a, you know, we'll don't have that kind of budget here, but there, what am I doing? I'm doing something wrong. So back to the humbling stuff. I reached out to a successful video production business owner they shot really high-end content i'm talking about stuff you see on tv all the time big brands i i reached out to him because i found out he lived in haverhill mm -hmm. um, and he had a, a filmmaking podcast too so that's i would listen to his podcast and one day he mentioned that he lived in haverhill i'm like hey he's right there this dude who owns a successful company and who has the most famous uh, po filmmaking podcast in the world, he still does, lives in Haverhill. I need to reach out to him. I need to go meet him. I need to go talk to him. That's my key. I need to, I need to go see what he does. I met up with him. I hit him up. And he, thank God he was willing to have coffee with me. And I'm like, hey, like, at the time, again, I was already, woof, I was making money. Man, I was, I was a business owner. Like, I was, I was legit. Paying taxes, I was good. But I knew there was another level that I, I wanted to break through and I couldn't by myself. And I told them, I'm like, hey, can I just go on your shoots? Can I go, can I come, can I join you? Can I help you for free? Like, I don't need you to pay me. I just wanna watch you. I just wanna learn how you operate this business, right? On another level. Cause I guess, like I said, his, his commercials were way different than what I was doing. He was doing very high end stuff. Um, so thank God, man, he, you know, like, I don't know, like he, he thought I was a nice person. And he said, you know what? You seem like an honest dude, honest guy. Um, yeah, you can come and be a PA for me. A PA. Let me just tell you what a PA is. Do you know what a PA is, first of all? Personal assistant. It's a production assistant. It is the bottom of the totem pole when it comes mm. to filmmaking like you are the lowest of the low if someone comes and asks you a director a, a camera guy hey come come wipe come buff my shoes out while i'm shooting this this, this shot here 
you go and do that. If they tell you, grab my gum from my mouth, take it out and go throw it in the trash, go do that. If they tell you to go get coffee, you're doing the coffee runs. You're nobody, pretty much. You're just whatever, you're extra hand, whatever they need. Mm. And I, it was humbling, really, it was, to be on set with them and just, like, me knowing I got my own business. I don't need to be here. I'm already, I'm making money. I've worked for myself. I have years doing this. But here I am on this guy's production set as the lowest person, you know. I put myself in the lowest position just so I can learn and I can watch this guy. And I did it for like three or four months, man. I was consistent. He had tons of shoots. So I was there, man, working. Yo, their hours are long, 10 hours, 12 hours. Me busting, man, busting my butt hard, man. No, you're, and not they, making other, you're not making other commercials at this point if you're working 10 hours plus. I, I, I know. I put that on pause. I, I wasn't really, I, 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 you know what, what it was? It was also around my slow season. So for my business, my slow season comes around the holidays, Christmas, all the way up until like March. And then March, they're picking up again. And it was just that time. It was literally right at Christmas. I started working with him. And so it, it kind of worked out. It worked out. And... I, like, I would be on set and they'd have some prop, you know, a lot of filmmaking is problem solving, right? They'd have so many problems going on on set and I'd just be there so quiet, like, oh, if you just do this, if you change this setting, if you move this light over here, you would fix it, if you, you know? And so many times I had to keep my mouth shut, right? Because I was nobody there. I was a PA. Eventually, I opened up little by little and I would give them some advice where they'd be like, oh, wow, like, amazing, you know? And... I got closer to them and all that stuff. And after those three or four months of me doing that, I felt like I need, I had what I needed. And that's what literally shifted everything for me in my business. After that, my business went to a whole nother level. I broke my first hundred K year. <laughs> I was so ecstatic, right? That was just my body. I never thought in my life, not in my life, but I never thought that my own business, this small little thing, I'd make even 100K. I broke it. I went woo, past it. And I was just, and I couldn't have done it without learning the things that I learned by PAing for him, right? Because I watched him. I saw how he treated his, his employees, his clients. His, his, I saw how he worked with, with, with his whole system, right? I saw how, even like what he paid people, like I didn't know about how you paid crews. How do you know what to pay a gaffer, that's the person that does the lighting. How do you know how to pay a makeup artist? Like, what do you, I learned so much in that short amount of time that when my business started rolling again after those three months in March and it started getting busy, got my first like 30K job, like one video, 30, like I was just like, and I was ready for it. I was ready for it, right? That's a big thing, right? Because they, I, that could have came at any point and I wasn't going to be ready for it. And I was going to make a disaster out of it. Right. But I was ready for it, man. It was, it was a bank. It was a, a bank and it was a commercial with like 40 people um, extras in it. And, and I needed to, you know, this was all on me. Right. I wouldn't have known any of that if it wasn't for, or how to handle any of that. If it wasn't for what I learned, um, PA, his name is Ben Consoli from BC Media Productions. Look him up. He does amazing work, and he gave me that opportunity, and I'm forever grateful for, to that guy. So, and But that was going back to, like, humbling yourself. Like, sometimes yeah. you, need to, you need to take a step back to take a step forward, you know? Well, like we said, like, knowing where you want to go. Right. And I think that, I think that that's, that's, that's where the key is. Like, know where you want to be, and then it, it, it may be humbling, but – you'll make those sacrifices because at the end of the day, you know what you're no. striving for. No. And man, I'm, I'm so glad that, um, that you shared that because I don't know, man, like with this whole like social media, all this Instagram stuff and all this like YouTube stuff, like there are a few people that are making money, man. But like, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was like this, this big news of this, this one girl that had like a bunch of followers, right? Like a ton. Right. And she ends up putting like a clothing line and all she needed to, for the company to continue to work with her was like sell like 12 pieces and she couldn't even get that. So just, just to show you that 
Wow. There's like this misconception that like because you have followers and like people are looking at your stuff that you that you can actually make monetize it, which is very different. Right. You know, you may have fans, but that doesn't mean like those fans are going to translate into That's you being able to make money off of that. Right. You know, um, man, I mean, we've we've been going on for for a while now. And I mean, I wish um, we definitely got to do a part two. Cause there's a few other things that I, that I definitely want to get into and more on like the business side of things and how yeah, you structure absolutely. your stuff. And obviously we don't have to get in super like details and get like super personal, but I think there's a lot in there when it comes to like managing, paying things that, you know, people are going to run across if they're going to be running their own business that I think would be helpful to um, touch base on. But I just want to thank you, man, for taking the time to, to sit down and, and, and share um, and, and sharing part of your, your personal life as well. And I just want to give you the floor for any last thoughts before we close. Um, I've kind of given all my golden nuggets, man. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, again, I, what wasn't mentioned much here was again, my, just my faith. Like most of this, I really give all glory to God for my, where, where I'm, where I'm, whatever successes I do have. Um, these are just the details that I'm giving you about how he used, you know, how he made it happen. But in reality, if you ask me how I am, where I am, I'm giving all the glory to God. So that's the last thing I got to say. So forget about everything else I said. <laughs> I find Jesus. <laughs> that's all. Enough, enough said. There's nothing else to be said about that. So, exactly. so. hey, man, thank you so much for joining me on this talk.